Okay, we're back. Um, and as I said, we're going to be talking about dealing with health inequalities and help having your diagnosis. And my fantastic guests are going to turn on their cameras and join me. And there we go. We've even got a caption to go with it. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. I've nearly finished my grapes, so you won't have to do too much of watching me munch away on grapes. I will try to mute myself while I eat those. While we're waiting, why don't we do some introductions? Um, and Nathan, why don't you go first? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nathan Stevens. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Association for Dementia Studies at uh, the University of Worcester, which is in England, not America. Um, I'm also an unpaid That's American, family. doesn't it? Worcester. Worcester. <laughs> yeah, it does, to be fair, yeah. I'm also an unpaid family care worker um, for my nan who's living with dementia. Thanks, Nathan. Clarissa. Yes, hi, uh, Clarissa Giebel, Senior Research Fellow at the University of Liverpool and the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration of West Coast, a mouthful. And my research, as you might all gather, looks at inequalities in dementia care after diagnosis. And, she's, or, and Nathan and Clarissa both blog on dementiaresearcher.nhr.ac.uk, not only about their work, but also about careers tips that they are learning along the way. And Kat, how go Hi, um, I'm Kat. I'm a dementia care researcher. Um, I'm based in the Norwegian University for Science and Technology, NTNU, but uh, before that was uh, had most of my career in Birmingham University. In and Kat, you were here two years ago. I'm sure Clarissa was as well, actually. But uh, certainly, Kat, you were here. And so if anybody goes to the Chathlon website and goes to the guests, you can also see what Kat, how Kat has changed and how her research has changed over the last two years. Go have a look. Still <laughs> using the same wrinkles. profile picture. Well, I'm the one that's got a more wrinkle. <laughs> yeah, it is the same profile picture. That's an academic thing, though. For those who aren't academics, you, you pick one picture from early on in your career and you stick with it forever. Um, Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Um, I'm going to go to Clarissa first and ask Clarissa to tell us all about your work. Great. Not put on the spot at all. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So as I just said, my research looks at what happens after a diagnosis if people, in fact, do receive a diagnosis. So my work is really mixed methods. So I come from a very neuropsych background, but since then I've focused much more on social care and how we can enable more equitable access to care after diagnosis. But also I am looking at research nationally, but also internationally. So I work a lot with the Netherlands recently. I've just come back from Australia and I'm still suffering from jet lag. And I've learned a lot about the aged care sector there, but also with what we class lower and middle income countries where we know that the majority of people with dementia live and unfortunately it's heavily stigmatized there. So even fewer people with dementia and their families receive support from the infrastructure and from the care system. So we've done a lot of work with Colombia and India and Uganda, for example. So in terms of some specific research projects, um, I've led on a couple of projects on how the pandemic has impacted social care access for people with dementia, which we've then expanded onto other countries. Uh, we've done a five country comparison, again, mixed methods. And what we've shown really early on was how the severe reductions in social care were actually linked to increased levels of depression, anxiety and reduced quality of life. So we know there's this direct link there, which means we need to put in more efforts to enable that equal access to care in the community so that, that everyone can live well. Another study we've just finished it has looked at finance management in, in dementia and care spending and how that's changed since the pandemic, which is now linking in with a report which I'm working on with the Alzheimer's Society on cost of living crisis. So there, for example, we showed that people from more disadvantaged backgrounds have less support in accessing financial support, which is kind of, that shouldn't be the way at all. They should receive all the support. But there's all these inequalities which are going against the Care Act, which is a legality, for example. Um, so yes, there's lots of work going on. And maybe just finally to mention, one of our ongoing pieces of work is looking at mental health needs of carers, the paid workforce, but also unpaid carers. And that really, 
came from our COVID research where we found no one really seems to get access to psychological support, but we need a good supported paid and unpaid workforce to support people with dementia live well. So lots of stuff going on. And so, do, do, I mean, that's all fantastic, very necessary research. Do do some of, do these studies also come with a, an interventional aspect of it that you can then say, well, OK, people aren't getting the support they need, but we know that if you do X, Y, Z, this can this can help. Because I'm guessing that a lot of what you're learning is what needs to find its way into policies. Yes, and that's a heavy aspect of our work as well. And we work a lot with unpaid carers, people with dementia and charities as well to try and take that next step. So with the finance management study, so we're working on the report with the Alzheimer's Society, but we've also produced recommendations of how we can hopefully enable more equitable access to the information so that people can then access care afterwards. But for the interventional aspect of the mental health study, so that's built into the funding project. So we're doing a large amount of interviews, then some focus groups, and then we've got funding to do co-production, to co-produce an intervention, to embed that within the care home sector, the home care sector, but also for unpaid carers. Because quite often these things are just layered, aren't they? First of all, you have to yeah. prove that there's a problem, there's a need, and then you build on top of that with how do you address that need thank you clarissa we'll we'll come back to you in a moment i'm going to go to um nathan next nathan because i i love your i love your work i love i hope you're going to talk a bit about meeting centers because i meeting centers is one of those very real things it's out there it exists tell us tell us about your work it's the only thing i know how to talk about to be honest <laughs> no, no that's good <laughs> no i'm joking uh, no yeah so my work is focused on meeting centres, but in particular, the Worcestershire Meeting Centres programme, which is the scaling up of meeting centres. And for anyone that doesn't know what a meeting centre is, um, it's a type of community based intervention for um, the person living with dementia, but also the family care care worker as well. And the idea is that it's uh, underpinned by the adjust interchange model which is that when someone gets a diagnosis of dementia they may need to adjust socially emotionally and practically to the changes that a dementia of di a diagnosis of dementia may bring um and essentially what that's what a meeting center tries to do in, in community buildings they're called members not patients or service users just trying to reduce the stigma around access in those types of community supports um so in worcestershire which is a county in middle england um We've got funding from the local authority to scale up the provision of meeting centres. So we set up 11 across the county. And my PhD is looking at the social and, and economic uh, value of scaling up meeting centres within Worcestershire. Um, I'm using a social value framework, which is basically thinks of value in terms of a broader concept. So that we need to measure social, economic and environmental outcomes in order to reduce inequalities and uh, reduce sort of uh, the, the impact on the environment as well. Um, and I guess that's where that became quite attractive to me because I, I'd done a master's in public health at Liverpool. Um, and that's where I first come across inequalities in the work of Mam and Kickbush on the social determinants and the commercial determinants health and all that sort of stuff. So this sort of framework really resonated with me. Um, so the research process has really involved um, well, it's mixed methods. So firstly, I've, I've identified all different stakeholders who are involved with the programme. So thinking about them in terms of their levels of activity. So you've got those sort of system players, so members of the integrated care system, and um, you've got the, the community and organisational level, you've got key refer, referral partners uh, in, in the public sector and in the private sector. You've also got the, the, the community based organisations that are delivering, delivering the meeting centres. And at an individual level, you've got the members, the family carers, the staff and volunteers. And I've just spoke to these people and these stakeholders to try and understand the changes that they've experienced or, or may not have experienced to build sort of a theory of change. Um, to understand the processes through which change happens within a complex system and complex systems and draw out some of the relationships between these changes. And then I've tried to develop this into an outcomes framework to measure these changes. 
and that's sort of the, the point which I'm at now. I'm trying to measure these changes to understand the level of impact. And then finally, I'll apply some cost benefit analysis to understand the, the cost effectiveness essentially of, of the whole program. And then I'm guessing that the hope is, is that, I mean, not to presume that you're going to find that this is worthwhile on all those different measures, but I'm guessing the hope is, is that you have the, the evidence you need to support this to become something that's bigger than it is now, which it's already pretty big now, right? I mean, we're talking about Worcester, but meeting centres are elsewhere in the country. Yeah, yeah, they're an international thing. I mean, I think there's over 180 in the Netherlands, which is where they orig originated from. They got translated into the UK in 2017. They also got translated in Poland and Italy at the same time as part of a three-year programme. But I mean, that they're in Japan, they're in Australia. They, they really are a, a global thing now. We've got 50, around about 50 in the UK at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of work going on within the University of Worcester now and trying to embed meeting centres in the long term. So how, how can we move sort of from this sort of um, academic environment? To how can we make it more of a sort of public domain? So how can we flip the sort of responsibility a little bit? And we just had a um, comment from somebody who's actually been to a meeting centre saying how how uh, in Hertfordshire and how it uh, was such a positive a positive experience for them and how they hope they've been nationwide. Thank you, Nathan. I'm going to come back because I'm conscious of time. I'm going to come to Kat now because yours isn't because you, you also have a great sounding intervention. Tell us about your work. Uh, thank you. Um, so yes, so my research career has all well, been very similarly about helping people living with dementia and those who support them to live as well as possible. Uh, most of my work has been uh, based in care homes uh, or in the community. Um, and it's all been about developing and evaluating psychosocial and creative interventions. So at the last chat on, I think I probably spoke about um, some art programs within care homes. Um, but since then, I've now moved to Trondheim in Norway, <laughs> and I'm now working on the Sense Garden Project, which is um, an immersive uh, digital, uh, immersive digital sensory room. Um, they were um, developed four months ago <laughs> in oh, a so European uh, project. So there are four currently in Norway, Portugal, Romania, and Belgium. Um, and I've joined last year to look at more in depth of how we can understand, have a deeper understanding of the emotional um, experiences of people within the sensory rooms. Um, so the rooms are um, to promote emotional stimuli, such as personal um, videos, photos, things that are meaningful to the person, um, to connect to senses such as sight, touch, hearing, balance, and so on. So for a basis of connecting with reality, um, but also um, connecting with uh, the human human. Um, interactions and emotional connections so somebody's uh, with you in the room um, you have a, a caregiver rather than a family member and a professional caregiver guiding you through a session to make it as meaningful as possible and my work is kind of looking at how we can measure those kinds of um, connections um, because I've also looked at social value in the past and yeah. used qualitative, quantitative, and it's really trying to get and measuring that, that space. <laughs> measuring that's so that is is kind of going to a next level, isn't it? That kind of measuring the emotional part is is I imagine that I'm sure the National Centre for Research Methods have got a tool. Mm. The, the, there must be some established system, but it sounds like it's one of the tricky ones. And it's great to see how you can see how all three. I know you don't work together. But you can see how how all these things are connect. Like how you know, if you were to bring in the the sense garden to join up with the meeting centres and maybe make those a permanent space rather than just you know the community hall once in a while, and and 
and Clarissa's work working with people, particularly in your own homes, that would in you know identify who needs this and why. Well, it sounds to me like everybody would benefit from this, to be quite honest. But how um, getting people out there into this spaces and and identifying the need for it is all this connects really nicely. Uh, I think so. I'm going to come back to um, Clarissa first of all. You, you mentioned at the start about your international work. I, I, have you learned anything from the Australia where you were recently, or, or in South America? Did you mention you work in South America? What are we learning from other countries that you can then bring back and bring here to to add to these things that that Kat and Nathan are doing? Good question. Also, for those of you who don't know, I'm German, so I have another perspective on the social care system as well and how dementia care and ageing care works. So um, I might be biased, but... Sorry about I've... the football. <laughs> so I know it works sometimes a little bit easier in other countries, but sometimes it doesn't. And there's always um, shortcomings in, in every system. But what I, for example, learned on my Welcome Trust visit to Australia so the aged care system there is someone gets needs assessed, just like in England, just like in the UK, but then they have to manage their own package of money and decide, I want to get a cleaner, I want to employ this person to come into my home and do this care. They have to set up the contracts with people. Wow. And if we consider someone has cognitive impairments and, and struggles with daily living in itself and then has to sort out these systems contracts that's not easy Have so, an individual weren't health, individual health budgets talked about here a long time ago didn't some places even try it out i'm not I sure whether they remember. were tried out so at first i was thinking oh that gives much more agency to people but then we have to consider it in the context of well cognitive impairment right? and, frailty. Yeah, and then it i mean in some ways it's kind of passing the book to say hey you can afford this or this which are you going to prioritize which is great that individuals are empowered to do that but it is also an awkward situation because you're going to push back and say no i need both those things you know do you want to eat or do you want me in medicine i mean it's nathan's gonna have a view on this because yeah, Nathan... <laughs> also I, we, we've got an inequality of information there's not a fair distribution of information and, and there's not enough distribution of information and i don't know that that's in the uk but i don't know if it, it probably exists in australia as well but i mean it'd be interesting to know whether they had a, de a dedicated person to, with them along this sort of decision sort of process but um yeah, yeah it doesn't seem so but on the person of uh, on the note of person uh, link person we've done some recent work on dementia care navigators so comparing the dutch system with the english system funded by the alzheimer's society and we found that in the netherlands care navigators seem much more common um and uh, utilized and facilitating access to care and information and knowledge whereas in england i know they exist after a lot of trying to find them I've worked in Liverpool for over five years. I only found out about them a year ago, that we've got now 10 navigators. So they're not readily advertised. As you say, Nathan, there's that barrier I'm not surprised of if information. It's on, only 10 of them to serve the whole of the population of Liverpool. That's I know. why they'll be dedicated. And it also sounds exactly like the kind of thing, and I, if anybody knows the answer to this, correct me or, or answer the question, is that... It's one of those local services that like a local GP has to decide if they want or local, you know, local health services decide their own priorities. It sounds exactly like something that a very local community health has decided that that's what they want and others haven't. I don't know. Mm. Is, it, is it the same in Norway, Kat? Do you know anything? Have you learned much about the Norwegian health system yet? In I'm that still getting to grips with it, I have to be honest. <laughs> um, but I've actually just come back from a two month placement in Portugal. So I was doing a bit of a feasibility um, study there to test out some of the methods. Um, again, based on caring, so I'm not sure about vision within the community and budgets. And so it sounds like there's definitely lessons both positive and negative we can learn from other countries to bring back back here and it's 
it's great if you like that some of the research funding that goes i think it tends to definitely be more the government funding i'm going to say than the charity funding to bring that unless i'm although oh, welcome is what welcome count as a it's an ngo isn't it so um uh to to bring those lessons uh, along and then build on the back of that so nathan you mentioned meeting centers so they started elsewhere in the world and were brought here yeah yeah so they were developed in so the this 90s. does happen <laughs> yeah in the early 90s yeah in the netherlands yeah and they're a formal part of the um the sort of social care structure in the netherlands funded majority by the state yeah but just on on the point of you were saying about gps have got this sort of power in terms of access to things it's interesting to note that gps practices in in in, in the uk in poorer areas, they received nearly 10% less funding per head compared to in richer areas. So you've also got those sort of barriers straight away before you even get to the point of what's available. And deciding then how to prioritize where you spend your money when, because that's in my questions, I'm sure you saw this in, in the questions I sent you, whether you're talking about sense gardens or covid interventions or loneliness or whether you're talking about meeting centers does fundamentally the real barrier to this because it sounds like you're going to get evidence to show all these things are worthwhile whether they're good use of money is a a question that i guess is going to come up uh but hopefully you'll find that they do is the real problem to all this then there's just we need more money can i can i start yeah go on please do Nathan. yeah um yes and no i think I think it starts with the ideology of the political, political economy. So the rules by which we govern our economy are inherently political. We've got a capitalist system in the, in the UK. We, we, it's the same in most developed economies. And I think that's just based on your increased extraction of wealth in society and you don't distribute the wealth fairly. And it's led to rising social inequalities, falling living standards. We basically destroyed the planet we've got an economic crisis right now. So it's proved it hasn't worked. And if you look at the, that uh, social gradient, which is quite helpful to understand um, what I'm trying to argue basically is that the more money you have essentially, the better health and increased likelihood of living longer you have. So it explains why if you, you're a woman in Glasgow, you, you die 20 years earlier than a woman in Edinburgh, for example, things like that. And it just proves that the way that the econo economy works is, is, isn't working. And we need to change the whole system by which we do business, really. And I think it's one more thing is that the kingdom of, of Bhutan, and I was really interested, and I went on a social value training program and they, they reference this. So the kingdom of Bhutan, they measure um, development or growth by gross national happiness. Now we use GDP here. But they, this is a complete different way to measure improvement and growth. And I think that's what we need to see, a complete change in, in, in the way we think about improvement and growth and development. That is fascinating. Do you need to write a blog on that? I, I, I'm interested in that topic because that is is another way to look at it, isn't it? I mean, I think this is the problem. We're going to hear from so many people today that are going to come and talk about great things that they've either already created or that exist now that so many people out there will look and go well where do i get my hands on that whether it's you know i want to go to a meeting center or a sense garden or the people before i want the dietary advice that they're getting but you, you don't know where to go because the care navigators aren't necessarily funded because local services have prioritized something over another or there aren't sense gardens because in our region we take a different approach i mean this isn't to say that everybody should have access to everything but it's making decisions with all that information you've got thank you nathan you make very very good points so what's next for all your research what's coming what's coming next what's exciting you most one thing that's exciting you most in the next few months cat you go first um, Christmas. Well, <laughs> Christmas, uh, <laughs> a brief visit to the UK. Um, yeah, I think what we've just been discussing actually is really important and that's something that I really um, want to try and take forward is how we actually implement and embed these interventions into practice because there are so many amazing things out there that once the research funding is they finish. Um, 
and so we need to do um, some more work in trying to embed those comments and that I'm really interested in. I completely agree. I was at a meeting this week that looked at falls prevention programs and so many of those programs had been around for many, many years and they were all super effective and they, they were, the conversations were still about how you embed these or spread them from one place, even though the evidence that their value has been around for a very long time that just goes from one grant to the next, but always the next grants about doing more research and it's only just now that they can talk about him creating that as a real service what about you clarissa yeah um two things i think picking up on what kat said it's about taking that next step and and trying to work much more with policy and decision makers so i've been on the royal society pairing scheme last year well this year and again hopefully uh next year being matched up with an mp to try and understand that interface between research and policy and decision making but also um, I've just set up a um, European task force on inequalities. And I wanted to advertise this year because it's an opportune moment to do this at this topic area. So if any of you researchers are part of Interdem, join the task force on inequalities because we're just starting out and it'd be great to have you all involved. Hmm. And if you're, sure, I'm over <laughs> here, right. Um, I start as well, I-S-T-A-A-R-T, -A -A I start from the Alzheimer's Association has uh, professional interest areas that look specifically at doing work on that too. And it's free to join if you're a student. Um, so that's something for the researchers watching. Nathan. Um, so really, I'd just like to um, obviously finish my PhD um, and have enough data to finish it. Um, but also hope that like some of the some of the findings, which haven't all been positive there's been quite a lot of area, a lot of areas for improvement to be quite frank about how we can scale up community-based interventions more effectively and more fairly i'd hope to see some of that implemented in worcestershire firstly and also taken on board with other projects that look to scale up their interventions i really hope you get the opportunity to do that and and again for anybody who's wanting to particularly clarissa and nathan's work keep on top of that come and have a look at their blogs on the dementia researcher website thank you very much um everybody um Bios, as ever, on the website, chathlon.uk, including their Twitter links, where I'm sure they regularly tweet updates about all their fantastic work. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'll let you three three go. Our next guests have sorted to arrive, and I'm going to eat two more grapes. And thank you so much again for joining. Cheers, Adam. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Adam. Bye. Okay, so I'll play a video in a second. To uh, but. Before I do, I'm just going to highlight again that um, all the information today, the rest of the program from today, uh, and details on how to make a donation can be found at chatathon.uk. Uh, I'm going to put a banner across the bottom of the screen, which you can see there. That should be working again now, so hopefully no problem. Or nobody's having problems donating. Please do keep the donations coming. I can see we've had quite a few this morning. Uh, honestly, even a pound would make a big difference to contribute to the to the bigger pot and help fund more of the researchers that we're talking to today. Uh, so coming up over the next half an hour, we're going to have a bit of a shift of pace because we're going to move on to understanding the potential causes of Alzheimer's disease. And we're going to have the first of our uh, slightly more uh, sciencey topics with uh, getting into the neuroscience. And I'm going to be joined by Richard Lofthouse and Mark Dallas, who are both there. Hi, both of you. While you're just settling in, I'm going to play a quick film from one of the charities that uh, who will benefit from the the work uh, from your donations today. We're going to hear from the um, the Lewy Body Society this time. Through my career, what I've seen is that people with Lewy Body really struggle much more than other people because of the different type of symptoms that people experience. It can be particularly complex because people have Parkinson's symptoms as well as what we call neuropsychiatric conditions, so hallucinations, delusions, and it's really difficult for the whole family. So I think people really are under-recognised and underserved, and so that's why I think it's really important they get better, better support. I want people to understand more about the condition. I want people to feel that they can access support and get a diagnosis. So getting a diagnosis is the first step to accessing support. 
And sometimes we have to push for that because a lot of professionals don't, still don't recognise Lewy body dementia and they don't understand it. So that's really what I want people to go read, be informed and to feel empowered and confident to be able to ask for a diagnosis. Thank you.